Okay, so we this afternoon we will re, we will review homework number four and we will review for the exam. Remember the exam is on chapters eight through 14. So the exam will not cover what we talk about today in class this morning, okay? So this will be uh, safe for the final. So chapters eight through 14, which basically means the, the, the exam is on inflation from chapter eight and the short run macro model, okay? I mean, so, uh, in general, exam number two is pretty focused on, on one big model, right? The short run macro model. And then also a little bit about what we talked about in, in chapter eight on inflation. So um, I'll have more to say about the exam, but my, my hope is that, you know, the, the form should look very similar in form to the first exam. It should be pretty similar in length to the first exam. Um, and then we'll kind of run it the same way that we did the last exam, where I will send you out an email at nine o'clock, and then you have to get it back to me by nine, what did I say, 12.15, okay? So you have basically three hours and 15 minutes to, to get it all back to me. And once again, you can put pictures or other um, inserts into the file, just as long as I can kind of read it and don't have to go searching around too much for um, what you put in there, so. Okay, so any, any quick questions about the exam tomorrow? All right, like I said, um, please come prepared with some questions if you have them so that um, we can get those answered this afternoon so that you're all set to go for the exam tomorrow. Okay, well, what are we gonna talk about today? We are gonna talk about fiscal policy, right? So we've talked about monetary policy a fair amount in this class. Um, today in chapter 18, we're gonna talk about fiscal policy. A lot of this is going to be what I would just call kind of factual material, right? Um, simple facts about the budget deficit. We'll talk about some, some theories of why governments should worry about running too big of a budget deficit. And then I'm also going to talk about some of the new developments in macro that really suggest that budget deficits are way overblown and that maybe we shouldn't worry so much about them. So we'll kind of talk about these things. And, you know, as I said, um, I think the good thing about today's lecture is that it is not um, particularly technical, right? So it will be a, a nice, um, a relatively easy morning. Of course, in economics, everything is relative. And so, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't want to say easy, but relatively easy. So, all right, let's, let's begin by just looking at a sample budget the federal government, just to kind of get a rough idea here, what the government does. Let me see if I can find this. Okay, chapter 18, fiscal policy and the government budget. So here's um, just a brief view of the government, the federal government budget. This is from your book, it's in 2018, but you know, honestly, if you looked at 2019 or 2020, it's not gonna be significantly different. Um, so just as a rough idea, this gives us an idea of, you know, what the government budget looks like. So if you look at expenditures here, total expenditures, expenditures, and expenditures means government purchases of goods and services plus government transfer programs. And government transfer programs include things like Medicare, Social Security, welfare, Right, so these are not where the government is purchasing goods and services. This is really where the government is transferring money from taxpayers to specific individuals. So if you take total government expenditures, it's about 20% of GDP or about, you know, a little bit over $12,000 per person, $12,500 per person. What are the biggest components of government spending? Well, Medicare health and Medicare, and we're gonna talk about this a little bit later. You know, if you wanna know the, the root of the government spending problem, it has to do with Medicare. And so we'll talk about why Medicare is such a, such a big issue. Social Security, right? National defense, income security, which is basically um, unemployment benefits and welfare, net interest, and then other. So, you know, Interestingly here, if you look at how the government spends money, the vast majority of government spending is on Social Security, Medicare, and welfare, right? And particularly Social Security and Medicare. 
right? That is a huge proportion of it. And then there's national defense. If you look at everything else the government does, it's actually a very small percentage of GDP, right? So, you know, this would be a theme that you're gonna hear from me um, many times this morning. But when you hear people say, oh, we need to cut, you know, we need to cut government spending, but I don't want to cut um, Social Security and I don't want to cut your Medicare and we're not going to cut national defense. Well, if you're not going to cut Social Security, you're not going to cut Medicare, and you're not going to cut national defense, there's really just not that much left. Right? <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it is. Um, you know, we increasingly have a government that, that transfers money between people. That is a large part of what government spending is, is Social Security, Medicare, and of course, interest payments on our debt. Um, so if you kind of take, if you, if you take those along with national defense off the table, there's not really a lot left to cut. Where does government revenues come from? Well, income taxes is a big, you know, the vast majority of it. Um, social insurance, Taxes, so this is your social security tax that you pay on your, ta your, your paycheck. Um, corporate income taxes, which is actually a very small portion of government revenue, a relatively small portion. And then you see this budget deficit, which is actually quite large, right? Our budget deficit in 2018 was almost 4% of GDP, or about $2,000, $2,300 a person. So there is a big disconnect, a relatively big disconnect between how much we spend and how much we take in in revenue, right? Uh, one other interesting thing here about government revenues is the U.S. is fairly unique in that we rely primarily on income taxes. Um, most countries have moved to consumption taxes. And so this makes us unusual, right? So most countries rely on, on consumption taxes, whether it's a national sales tax or a value-added tax. For those of you who have traveled some, uh, particularly if you travel to Europe or to Canada, uh, you might be familiar with a value-added tax. A value-added tax is basically, it is a consumption tax, but it's built into the price of goods. So at every stage of production, at, at kind of the value that a firm adds to the good at a stage of production um, gets taxed. And so basically firms add that tax into the price of goods. So, you know, if you ever look at a receipt when you're in France, for instance, it will actually break down, you know, I paid, you know, three euros for this uh, croissant and it will say, you know, half a euro went to your VAT, your value added tax. Right. And so this is actually, um, well, let's be honest, value added taxes and consumption taxes are probably a better way of raising money. <laughs> First off, it's a lot harder to cheat on them. Second, there's probably good reasons to think about taxing consumption as opposed to income. One reason is, is it tends to encourage savings. Right. When you tax consumption, you are giving people an incentive to save and to invest in capital. And so when you tax income, you're actually disincentivizing savings because savings creates income that gets taxed. So there, there's a number of, of advantages to a value-added tax, um, but you know, we're the United States, we do things different, and so we, we focus on income taxes. Um, yeah, but you know, I, I think for many of us, we've never really thought about this, but the US is, is a fairly big outlier. Um, we're one of the few countries in the world, maybe the only one I can think of, that relies so heavily on income taxes. If you look over time here at the balance between government revenue and government spending, you can see the spending curve in blue, the revenue curve in yellow. And so there's really been two trends that are, that are driving this decline in, or the, this, this increase in the, the U.S. budget deficit. One is we're collecting less revenue, in part because we continue to want to cut taxes, right? <laughs> um, politicians uh, know that the public likes cutting taxes, and so we continue to cut taxes in the U.S., and that's led to a small decline in revenue. And then there is a 
continued increase in spending. This in continued increase in spending is almost entirely because of Medicaid and Social Security, right? So this, the increase in spending isn't necessarily because Congress and the president have been choosing to spend more, though in many cases that's, that's true. But a lot of this is just simply the fact that we have an aging population. More people are qualifying for Social Security, more people are qualifying for Medicare, and so our spending in those programs continues to go up and up and up. So the baseline, right, if, if government policy just stayed as it was and never changed, we would continue to see an increase in government spending because of changes in our demographics. And this is only going to get bigger over time. There's one other thing here that I'll note about government spending and revenue. Notice that budget deficits are pro-cyclical. And what I mean by that is budget deficits go up. No, did I say that wrong? I said that wrong, sorry. Budget deficits are counter-cyclical. <laughs> Apologize. Budget deficits go up when the economy slows down, right? So you can see this here in 2008 and 2009. What happened when we went into the 2008 global financial crisis? Spending went up, right? Because we passed stimulus packages and more people qualified for welfare and unemployment benefits. So spending goes up, but tax collections go down because there's less income being made. And that is certainly gonna be true in 2020, right? Where we are talking about a massive increase in the budget deficit where in 2018 the budget deficit was close to 4%, there's a possibility that our budget deficit this year could be closer to 8 to 9% of GDP, right? Um, we don't know. Uh, Congress right now is talking about passing another big fiscal stimulus package. I was actually just reading about this before I got in the class. Um, but they're looking on the order of a trillion dollars, right? So one trillion dollars when one tr trillion dollar package, um, given that US GDP is a little bit over 20 trillion, right there, that's 5% of GDP in, in terms of a, um, an addition to our budget deficit. So yeah, we are looking at some massive budget deficits this year. Um, let's see, let me show you some more figures here. So when we talk about the budget deficit, let's be very clear here. The difference between the budget deficit and the government debt, okay? The deficit is our annual borrowing. And usually as economists, we like to express that as a percent of GDP. So the, in this figure here, you see the green line is the annual budget deficit as a percent of GDP. And so we've been pretty consistently running a budget deficit in the United States, well, for a long time. We, had, we basically had a brief period of budget surpluses in the late 1990s under Bill Clinton. And we had a little bit of budget surpluses after, the world, after world War II. Um, but you know, basically since the 1980s, we've been running fairly consistent budget deficits that only seem to have been getting bigger as a percent of GDP. But the deficit is the annual borrowing. The budget debt is the accumulated borrowing, right? The accumulated borrowing over time. So the blue line here represents the US debt to GDP ratio. This is looking at debt relative to the size of our GDP. And here we see that the debt is rising, you know, um, well, as we're gonna talk about, there, there's, there's actually a few complications in measuring what exactly this debt is. But the debt to GDP ratio is something between 80 and 100% of GDP. So in other words, the US government owes about a year's worth of income in debt. Is that a lot or a little? We'll talk about that, right? Um, but there, there's good reason to think that this year alone, we will be adding significantly to that debt to GDP ratio, right? We might be adding upwards of 10% in this year alone to that debt to GDP ratio. Who owns this debt? 
Well, um, U.S. citizens, for the most part, right? If you actually look at the data to see who owns this debt, about half of it is owned by U.S. citizens. About 30% is owned by foreign citizens. Um, the two biggest foreign holders of U.S. debt are China and Germany. Not surprising, right? These are two big countries. Germany is a rich country. China is getting richer. There are also countries that save a lot, right? So Germany and China are probably the two biggest savings countries in the world. And so where do they save? Well, the U.S. remains a very attractive place to save. And particularly U.S. government debt is still seen as a very attractive way to save. So 50% owned by U.S. citizens, 30% owned by foreigners, 20% is actually owned by the U.S. government. And you might say, well, how in the world is the U.S. government owning its own debt? Well, part of this is the Fed, right? We know about open market operations and quantitative easing. We've talked about that. What does, has the Fed done? It's bought up a lot of government debt. And so a big chunk of this is, is held by the Fed as a result of monetary policy, um, particularly in 2008. Also, Social Security Administration holds, holds some of this debt. So for years in which the Social Security, um, Social Security Fund is in surplus, what do they do with the surplus? They actually hold U.S. government debt. So it, it does seem kind of unusual that the, you know, it's kind of like the left hand lending to the right hand, right? That the U.S. government holds some of this debt, but that is in fact the case, right? And that's the case because the Fed buys it. Also the Social Security Administration in years that it had surpluses. Um, how does this compare to the rest of the world? Just to kind of get a, a basis of comparison here. Here you see government spending across countries. Um, listen, the U.S. is relatively low government spending country, right? Particularly relative to countries like France, where over half of GDP is spent by the government, right? So the U.S. is, is you know, relatively uh, a low government spending country. If we look at our debt to GDP ratio, we see that the U.S. is not necessarily out of whack with many other countries. Um, of course, you have Germany that has a relatively low debt to GDP ratio. And then you have the U.K. right, that has, you know, lower than the U.S., Italy, and then Japan. Japan right now has a debt to GDP ratio that's risen upwards of 200% of GDP. So one of the things we see is that rich countries actually do borrow quite a bit, right? So have relatively high debt to GDP ratios. So the US is not necessarily an outlier here. Um, but one of the things that we see is that these debt to GDP ratios across the globe have definitely gone up and up and up. And I wanna talk about why that is here in a couple of minutes, because as I said, I think there's a lot of new thinking going on in economics as we, as we kind of see what's happened to debt and government debt among rich countries. Economists are, are maybe rethinking a little bit about how we think about that, right? So we'll, we'll kind of talk about that. But before we get into the kind of the big picture thinking, I want to talk a little bit more about how should I say this, the mechanics of government debt, right? Just to make sure that we understand how government debt works in terms of a government budget constraint. So let me switch over here to my iPad. Oh, come on, hook up. All right, technical problems. Let's see if we can get this to work. I don't know why it's sometimes my iPad does not want to sync. Ah, here we go, good. Okay, so let's talk about 
government budget constraint. Okay, the government budget constraint. So just like we have budgets and a budget constraint, the government has a budget constraint too. And so we could think about this government budget constraint in the following way. So one way to think about the government budget constraint is you can just say that for any government, the uses of funds have to be equal to the sources of funds. Sorry, I have a typo here. This should be TR, not T. Okay, so this is government purchases. transfer payments, and this is interest payments on the de debt, right? Those are the three things that the government uses money for. They use it to purchase goods and services, transfer payments, and they have to make interest payments on their debt. What are their sources? Taxes. Borrowing or they can change the money supply. Okay. So pretty straightforward. The government has uses for money and they have really three big sources. They can collect money through taxes, they can borrow the money, or they can change the money supply, right? Okay, just to keep things simple, let's forget about the money supply, all right? <laughs> um, <clears throat> why? Because while the money supply does is a, is a source of revenue for the US government, it's not a large one, and that's not really the purpose of, of the money supply. So if we're gonna think about the US government here, we can just kind of forget about the money supply for a minute, right? So then, if given that, another way of thinking about this is you can rewrite this budget equation in this way. Yeah. Okay. So just rewriting, you can think about it as what is our government debt next period? It's the government debt this period plus what we pay in interest on the debt. And then this is our deficit. So for instance, what's this going to be in period two? It's going to be one plus I times the amount of bonds that you have in period one plus your deficit in period one. And you can work this forward into period three. What's bonds in period three going to be? It's going to be 
government spending or government purchases in period two plus transfer payments in period two minus taxes in period two. So just to keep things simple, this is gonna sound like a very weird assumption. Let's assume that the world ends in period three. Right? <laughs> In other words, let's just assume we have a two period model here where B3 has to equal zero, right? Because the world is ending. So if you plug this equation for B2 into the equation for B3, remembering that B3 is equal to zero, then you can solve for this. And there, there's just a little bit of algebra here. I'm not gonna do it all because it's, it's kind of hard to do algebra on this pad. But I think actually the intuition is pretty straightforward. If I can write. Okay, so if you plug B, the equation for B2 into the equation for B3 and then just kind of regroup, this is what you get. <clears throat> Anybody want to help me interpret this? What's this? Look at all familiar. It should. I know we have some finance majors out there. Right? What is this? Dividing by one plus I. Doesn't look familiar. Cole, you're a finance major. Come on, help me out, man. What is this? You got nothing for me, huh? This is a present value, right? This is present value. This is the present value of government purchases What's this? Present value of transfer payments And what's this? present value of taxes. If you expend this further out, what do you get? You get 
you can extend this logic further out. And once again, all we're saying is that here's the present value of spending. And this is the present value of tax revenue. So the intuition of this is actually very, very simple. What has to be true for any government? Do they have to balance their budget every single year? No, you can borrow, all right? So the constraint is not you have to budget, balance your budget every single year. The constraint is you have to balance your budget over the lifetime of the government, right? In other words, the question here is whether the present value of spending is equal to the present value of taxes. So in other words, to put this a different way, you can run a deficit today if the market thinks you will pay it back in the future. That's the simple intuition, that it's okay to run a, de a deficit today as long as markets think that you'll pay it back in the future. If they think you're gonna pay it back, then you're not violating this equation that the present value of spending has to equal the present value of tax revenue. Those I's or T's underneath your... Uh... Well, this is I, sorry, it's probably hard to read my writing here. This right here is I, and that's an I, right? That's the interest rate. Yeah, I'm sorry, I'm underneath your- uh, An I there too. One or your values, or I'm sorry, I can't think of what the hell they're called, but. Uh, the, here? Zero or I equals zero. These are T's. Okay. Just want to make sure. Right, so we're talking about T meaning time. So over all time periods, the present value of spending has to equal the present value of tax revenue, right? Plus this one plus I times B, right? Basically, this is where you start. So you can, you run a deficit today and you can borrow today if the market thinks you're gonna pay it back in the future, okay? And so what goes into this? What, what goes into this belief of markets thinking that you can run a deficit today um, because you'll be able to pay it back in the future? Well, this is an idea that economists call debt tolerance. And debt tolerance is just es essentially Do markets believe Do markets believe you will pay back current deficits in the future and not violate the multi-period government budget constraint. So do markets believe that you're, you're, you won't violate the, the constraint, right? <clears throat> what determines debt power? Well, in reality, a lot goes into this because this is about beliefs, right? Um, another way of saying this is this is about trust. Do markets trust your government's ability to pay back money and not violate this you know, multi-period government budget constraint? So what goes into this? A lot of things. History, right? Has your country shown 
that it pays back its bills? What are its institutions? Is it a political disaster where governments fall apart every day or is it stable? Is there economic growth? Because obviously more economic growth is gonna give you more revenue to pay back your bills in the future. Related to growth, there's this old belief that if your deficit to GDP percentage is less than your growth rate, you are fine, <laughs> right? So in other words, if your economy is growing faster than your deficit, you probably don't have anything to worry about because you're accumulating debt at a rate that's lower than your ability to pay that debt off. The key thing I want to emphasize here though is this actually differs vastly across countries, right? There is no magic debt to GDP ratio that, that triggers a debt crisis. And by a debt crisis, I mean a sudden stop in lending. Where markets just suddenly say, no, we're not lending anymore. There is no magic debt to GDP ratio that once a country passes it, they have a debt crisis. Um, so for instance, most debt crises throughout history have taken place at relatively low debt to GDP ratios. Why? Because they're countries that don't have a lot of debt tolerance. So when you see a country like Japan that has 200, has a debt to GDP ratio of, two, of 200, right, 200%, one way you could look at that is, whoa, Japan's likely to have a debt crisis in the future. I think that's exactly the wrong way to look at it. <laughs> it's, the thinking is actually backwards. The fact that, debt, that Japan has so much debt suggests that they're less likely to have a debt crisis. Why? Because markets believe that they're a good bet to pay the money back, right? To see what I mean, just, just think, I, I just think in my own personal life, would I rather lend $10,000 to Warren Buffett or $100 to my uncle? Any day of the week, I'd prefer to lend $10,000 to Warren Buffett than $100 to my uncle, right? Because Warren Buffett is a good bet and he'll pay it off. And my uncle is a screw up and he will not, right? <laughs> and, so, and so, you know, what's, a better, what's better from my perspective to lend a lot of money to a country that's gonna do, you know, pay it back as opposed to lending a little money to countries that won't pay it back. And so this idea that somehow there's this magic debt to GDP ratio, I, I see this in many discussions about debt, right? Like many people have said, oh, the US is at a 100% debt to GDP ratio. That means that we're, we're screwed. We should be having a debt crisis any day now. No, not at all. Right, it, it doesn't mean that. And in fact, it might mean exactly the opposite of that. That the fact that so many people are willing to lend the US government money suggests that we're not gonna have a debt crisis. This is at the root of something that shows up in the macro, that, 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 that economist paper that I've assigned you to read for your, for, your, um, for your writing assignment, which is something called modern monetary theory. Just, I want to just say a couple of words about this because 
for those of you who pay attention, you, who read The Economist or pay attention to the news, this is a, a, a strangely enough, an idea that, that is getting tossed around more and more in the news and it's, it's kind of coming into the public consciousness. So I, I want to talk about it here so that we understand what exactly does modern monetary theory mean? The idea here is countries like the US have huge amounts of debt tolerance. As a result, we can essentially borrow, and if you look at what the market is saying, it's essentially saying that the US government can borrow at 0%. Because nominal interest rates are close to 0%. And real interest rates, are less than zero, as we talked about in homework number three, that the US government now here is essentially borrowing at negative real interest rates. Thus, borrowing and issuing debt is no different and just printing up money. But no inflation. The idea here is, listen, if you can borrow at 0%, it's not any different than, than printing up money. When the government prints up money, what, it, what is essentially, what is a piece of currency? In some ways, you can think about it as a bond but it's a very weird bond. It's a bond that pays no interest. And what does it get paid back with? Other pieces of money. So what could, in a world of zero interest rates, what is a bond? A bond is something that pays zero interest. And what can you pay it back with? Other bonds. You just keep on issuing bonds to pay back the existing ones. And as long as there's debt tolerance, in other words, as long as there's people out there to buy it, you can just essentially issue as much debt as you want. And so you can kind of see now maybe where people are, are, are going here. Issuing debt is actually preferable to issuing money because you don't have to have, worry about this problem of inflation. And so the implication here is that governments can borrow much more than previously thought. And so proponents of this basically want to see, you know, huge increases in government spending because we can do it, right? Um, the proponents of this argue that we should be increasing the deficit to fund massive investments to fund massive investments things like um, improving education increasing public investment Uh, they argue, don't worry about the fiscal stimulus. Right? Borrow a trillion bucks. Go for it. <laughs> it's more important to think about short-run output than it is about future deficits. So, yeah, go for it. Go, go borrow a trillion dollars. Um, if we need to invest in things to, like, reduce inequality, um, if we need to forgive student loans, something that might be close to your heart, 
Go for it, right? Let the government borrow. So, you know, as you can imagine, probably the people that are most, uh, most fervent believers in this kind of theory are, tend to be political liberals, right? Um, tend to be the progressive wing of the Democratic Party who are arguing we should be spending more in making strategic investments in the economy. And so there's people, you know, that are advising Biden. I, Biden seems resistant to this, but um, there's been a plan that's been floated by some members of Congress that forgive everybody $20,000 of their student loan. Um, right. And why? Because the government can borrow it. The government can afford it. Um, should we be spending more on public investment, roads, bridges? Sure. Do we need to have another round of bailouts for COVID? Sure. Borrow it. Right? Borrow it. Um, I, you know, I'll have to say for myself, I, I usually don't like to do too much commentary here. I have, <laughs> I, 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 I'm not quite persuaded by this, right? I'm not quite persuaded by this. First off, I do want to say that there is a lot of evidence that this is in fact true, that, that this part of it is, that governments can borrow much more than what was previously thought. I mean, just look at it, right? The government this year is going to be borrowing upwards of 10% of GDP. If, if, the, if the government was really facing a constraint, wouldn't interest rates be going up? The fact that the government continues to borrow so much and interest rates go down suggests that there is a lot of debt tolerance, meaning it suggests that a lot of people want to lend money to the government. And so why shouldn't the government borrow at 0% when we have pressing needs, right? It should, right? particularly during a period of economic downturn, that's the classic time that you wanna borrow. So that part of this I'm persuaded by, right? That, that this idea that somehow we can't let debt to GDP ratio go above 100% or that we have to keep, you know, what did I write down here? That we have to maintain a deficit as a percent of GDP that's less than our growth rate. No, no, I think you can go much over that. I think the evidence suggests that. But personally, I have not yet quite been persuaded that that doesn't mean that you can go unlimited amount of debt, right? <laughs> that I do worry that there is a limit of, of a country's debt tolerance. Even for the United States, there's a limit to our debt tolerance. And so, you know, I... I I guess maybe this just kind of makes me more of a pragmatic economist, right? That while I, I'm, I'm somewhat persuaded by this, this argument, I'm, I'm kind of reluctant to go to the full extreme of this argument, which is that we should just be borrowing um, willy-nilly and you know, worry the consequences be damned because there aren't any consequences because one of the things we know in economics is rarely is there a free lunch, right? And so, I, yeah, I, I think, now that I, I say that, I think that's, that's my resistance to modern monetary theory, is it seems too much like a free lunch, right? <laughs> it seems too much like, oh, perfect, all our problems are solved. But in economics, is really so easy, right? It's really so easy. But having said that, right, I do really think that, particularly for a country like the United States, not for a country like Kenya, right, <laughs> or not for a country like Argentina, but for a country like the U.S., um, you know, we have a lot more debt tolerance and a lot more ability to run up deficits than, than I think many economists had thought in the past. All right, um, let's talk about debt crises, but maybe we should do that after break. So let's, we'll, we'll take a little break here and then I want to talk about a little bit about what happens in a debt crisis in other countries. And we'll talk a little bit about a couple of other issues related to government debt. Okay. Uh, back in, let's say, five minutes, right? So 10 o'clock. <laughs> 
All right, everyone. I don't know if I like living in a world in which I can unload the dishwasher during break. So <laughs> it's kind of nice multitask, not to have to do when you get home, but on the flip side, it's it's kind of weird. <laughs> I still haven't really kind of figured out or uh, I guess psychologically adjusted to this teaching at home thing, but, and you probably are struggling with the same stuff when it comes to learning at home. The distractions and everything else are probably significant, but. Okay, um, so let's let's move on here in the interest of time, because I do want to kind of make sure that we finish up chapter 18 um, the, in just this morning session. Let's talk a little bit about debt crises. Um, what is a debt crisis and how do they proceed? What are the consequences? So a debt crisis is essentially a sudden stop in a government's ability to roll over its debt. At any point in time, not only are governments issuing new debt, but they're rolling over old debt, meaning that old debt that, that is maturing, um, they're basically paying off those bondholders and issuing new bonds to pay off for the old ones. And so what happens is when markets lose confidence, right? In other words, when markets essentially decide that a country no longer has the debt tolerance to pay back its bills, markets will stop lending, right? So people will become much less, uh, much more reluctant to borrow their bonds. And as a result, governments cannot borrow enough and they find that there's this sudden stop, right? Where their ability to borrow drops like a rock. What happens? Well, really a number of things are probably going to happen to a country that undergoes a debt crisis. One is they're probably going to have forced austerity. And austerity is basically a fancy word for they're going to have to cut spending and raise taxes. In other words, almost certainly this forced austerity is going to, going to lead to a recession and lead to a fall in short run output, sometimes dramatically. Oftentimes, the country will have a banking crisis. Why? because banks hold a lot of government debt. This is one of the primary assets that banks hold. I think we talked about this a little bit yesterday. And so if a government defaults on its debt, likely who is it defaulting on? Banks, right? And so it's very common that you will have a banking crisis associated with this. Sometimes you'll have an exchange rate crisis. Many times that investors in your country will lose confidence in your financial system, in your banking system, in the economy as a whole, and they will try to pull all their capital out, right? That's what we call capital flight. And if everybody tries to pull their money out at the same time, 
and start selling your currency like crazy, it's going to lead to a big drop in your exchange rate that's going to have a number of economic consequences. Finally, it could lead to hyperinflation. And we've talked about this before, that some countries, the central bank tries to cover your debt by monetarizing it. Meaning, how do you pay off your debt? You just print up money. You turn that debt into money. And so all of the major hyperinflations in history have all been associated with debt crises, right? Hyperinflations go hand in hand with debt crises. Countries that suffer from hyperinflations often are forced, or I'm sorry, countries that suffer from debt crises are often forced to just print up money to pay their bills, leading to a hyperinflation. So all of this is disastrous, right? All of this is pretty disastrous. When a country goes through a banking crisis, you can expect them to have a massive fall in short run output. And you know, basically, uh, I won't go through it all, but you can think about our short run macro model explains this. That when you have a debt crisis, what are you gonna get? You're gonna have big falls in A bar, you're gonna have big rises in F bar. In our short run macro model, at least to this extent, we don't have exchange rates. We're going to change that a little bit on Friday um, after your exam. But you know, in, in many ways, a debt crisis looks a lot like a financial crisis, at, at least in terms of our model, right? It looks a lot like a, a, our, our model. And so you're likely to have big falls in short run output that could lead to, you know, pretty significant recessions. Short of this, and by short of this, I should say, short of a debt crisis, Why do some countries worry about growing debt? And the answer is something, an idea that we talked about in principles, which is crowding out. So short of a debt crisis, why do some countries worry about getting too much debt? Well, the problem is crowding out, right? The problem is crowding out. Let's see what crowding out is. Let's just start with our expenditure equation. Here's our expenditure equation. And then on this side, I want to add in TR and subtract TR. And I want to add T and subtract T. I actually might have done this earlier in class. I think I did this um, a few days ago. I can't remember, maybe we're talking about the IS curve. And so now what I want to do is I want to collect things together. So I'm going to put over here, I'm going to put Y, I'm going to put the minus TR over here because it comes plus TR. Put the plus T as a minus T on this side. And lump that all together. Lump that together. 
put that together. And I'm going to leave I over here on this side. So basically, I've just uh, we lump things together. Why have I lumped them together in this way? Because there's an intuitive explanation of what these things are. What is this? Private savings. If you take people's income and add in the transfer payments they receive, and then you subtract out how much they, they spend in taxes and subtract out how much they consume, the difference is private savings. This, is government savings. How much the government saves. It's the negative of the deficit, right? It's the negative of the deficit. And this is foreign savings. So altogether, this equation is just saying total savings equals investment. All right, so in many ways, this is, this is pretty intuitive. It has to be true in an economy that total savings equals investment. And so maybe you can understand now what crowding out is. Crowding out says, ceteris paribus, meaning all else being equal, lower government savings, in other words, higher deficits, reduce investment. That's what crowding out is. Like that's what crowding out is. And I have the hardest time spelling on this thing. <laughs> crowding out. Sitters paribus Lower government savings, meaning higher deficits, reduce investment. And so the concern in the long run is that government deficits lead to higher interest rates and lower growth. And so short of a debt crisis, this is the reason why many governments are very leery about borrowing too much. However, this is not the case for the US. The, the US does not appear to be very vulnerable to crowding out. As I said, what's happened is the government borrows more and more money. Interest rates continue to be very close to zero, but the US is special. As we're going to talk about, the U.S. is absolutely special. And so we do not have to worry about crowding out nearly as much. If we go up to this equation, why is that? Well, remember, crowding out says ceteris paribus, right? All else being equal, lower government savings means lower investment. But the fact of the matter is, for the U.S., all else is not equal. And what's not equal for us is foreign savings. The U.S. is very attractive to foreign savers, right? The U.S. is very attractive to foreign savers. And so while our government borrows a lot of money and we save very little in terms of private savings, basically foreigners bail us out <laughs> by saving in our financial markets by buying our debt, particularly our U.S. government debt. And so the evidence is pretty clear here that the U.S. doesn't have to worry about crowding out nearly as much as other countries. But crowding out is a big issue for other countries, right? So, you know, for instance, Canada faces a much different situation than the U.S. does. Does Canada have to worry about crowding out? Absolutely, right? Because it's not, it doesn't have the huge developed financial markets that the U.S. does. 
and it doesn't have the ability to borrow from abroad nearly as much as the U.S. does. So it has to be much more cognizant of the fact that if the government begins to borrow up a lot of money, that it's going to drive up interest rates and reduce investment. And in the long run, that could have consequences. So you will hear this time and time again from me here over the next couple of days. <laughs> the U.S. is special. When we, when we start talking about international macro, which is really kind of how we're going to finish out the class here after your exam, whenever you talk about international issues, the U.S. is special. We have a special situation. And this special situation largely has to do with our financial markets and our currency. The dollar is largely the global currency. And as a result, the U.S. financial market is, no pun intended, the gold standard of financial systems. As a result, we have this unending ability to get people to buy our dollars and to buy our dollar assets. And so that puts us in a very unique position, one that allows us to borrow a lot more than any other country. And that can be a good thing, that may also be a bad thing, right? <laughs> in the sense that, um, you know, sometimes if, if you can borrow too, if you can borrow too much, you do borrow too much. And, you know, that I, I think, of, of course, is always the worry for the U.S. is by not having any of these constraints, um, we'll go crazy, right? And maybe they're, you know, some people might believe that we're already doing that. So um, just to finish out this morning, I want to talk just about a little bit about future issues related to the budget deficit. Flip back to my notes here. You can kind of think about this as uh, fiscal issues in the 21st century, right? Like, wh what do, what's going to be true about budget deficits in the future? We know quite a bit about this. <clears throat> One of the things we know is that almost certainly U.S. budget deficits are going to go up in the future. Um, regardless of who is president, regardless of how long COVID lasts, regardless of, of any number of exogenous shocks that could or could not take place, we are likely to have rising deficits. Why? Because revenues are flat, but government spending is rising. And why is government spending rising? If we look here at figure 18.6, the red line is revenues, which are projected to be basically flat. The blue line is, and the green line are federal spending. Spending is going up, but why is spending going up? Because of Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. So as these continue to become bigger and bigger, um, our, our spending is going up. And unless we adjust revenues to account for that, we are almost certainly going to have bigger deficits in the future. And so this is likely to push up our debt to GDP ratio. And here's the um, Congressional Budget Office's most recent estimate of what's going to be happening to the U.S. debt to GDP ratio. This does not include any of the COVID money, I don't believe. So, you know, only add to this if we have another um, federal bailout. But yeah, you know, we are projected by the year 2050 to get to about 200% of GDP our debt to GDP ratio being about 200% of GDP. What's driving all of this? Well, I think there's, there's really two things that are driving this. One of them is just our aging population. So demographics are driving this. And an aging population means that more people are getting Social Security and more people are getting Medicare. And so you can see here, um, this is looking how the U.S. budget spending has changed since 1970 to what it's going to look like in 2030. And if you look up here at the top at the outlays, you can see how health care and Social Security have rapidly grown as a percent of spending, while defense spending has gotten smaller and non-defense spending has gotten smaller, and net interest has gone up a little bit, but it's stayed the same. So all of this is driven by Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security, right? Um, so Social Security is, has risen from 1970 from a little bit less than 3% of GDP to a, about 6% of GDP today, and Medicare 
has risen from less than 1% to 7% of GDP. So um, a lot of this has to do with what we talked about um, yesterday, this old age dependency ratio, right? Um, I shouldn't have percentages here, but this is really, the dependency ratio is the number of people over the age of 65 divided by, well, no, actually I have this expressed a different way than I did yesterday. So this, this dependency ratio is expressed as the percentage of the population over 65 divided by the population that is between 20 years of age and 65, basically the working age population. And we can see here that this has risen dramatically. Of these two programs, Social Security and Medicare, which is the one that's causing the biggest problems? No doubt, it's Medicare, right? And you can see that here. Social Security is driving higher government spending, but not nearly at the rate of Medicare and Medicaid. Why? Social Security is only driven by the demographic problem. Okay, so the, the, the only reason why Social Security spending is going up is because we are getting an aging population. The benefits of the program are not changing. Um, you know, it's just because we have an old, older population. Medicare is driven in part by demographics, but also something at least as important, and that is the problem of health care inflation, right? So, or medical inflation. The biggest problem in Medicare, or, or, or you know, I don't know if it's the biggest, but it is certain, certainly right up there with the, the changing our demographics, is this problem of medica, medical inflation. One of the more surprising facts that I've learned here over the last couple of years is, do you know that of your lifetime medical expenses, half of them will be incurred the last six months of your life, right? So in other words, half of your lifetime medical spending is gonna be incurred the last six months of your life. <laughs> so new technologies, new technologies that are out there to extend life, particularly at the end of life, right? And this relates to things particularly like cancer treatments, heart disease, are, have, are extremely expensive. And so, you know, these things are driving up healthcare costs over and above the fact that we have an older population. Why? Well, in part, life is a normal good. And what I mean by that is, if you remember what economists mean by a normal good, a normal good is a good in which when you're richer, you spend more on it. And so one of the things that we see as Americans is as we become richer, one of the things that we want to spend more money on is health, right? Um, what is it? The typical American now has between five and six elective surgeries during their lifetime. And by elective surgeries, I mean things like, you know, getting your knee scoped or getting some big mole removed on your face or whatever, right? <laughs> things that are not life and death, but things that improve the quality of your life. And that makes sense, right? I mean, obviously, as we get richer, one of the most important things to us is our health, right? But the fact of the matter is, not only do we have this problem of new technologies being very expensive, but we also have this problem that we wanna spend more and more money on new technologies so that we can improve our health. And so you see this, everywhere, but you see it worse in the United States. Why? Because we have a completely screwed up healthcare system. <laughs> um, well, I shouldn't say completely screwed up, but we definitely have a, a screwed up healthcare system, right? <laughs> in the sense that in the US, nobody pays attention to the cost of what they of their health care. Why? Because we have this private insurance set up. So I pay money every month for my insurance 
after that, I couldn't give a rat's ass how much anything costs, right? As long as it's covered. And so people don't shop for cheap health care. People, in, in, in essence, are incentivized to spend more on their health care once they buy this insurance. It's the classic example of moral hazard. If somebody else is paying for it, I'm going to consume more of it. And so, you know, we, we have this, this, very, you know, this, this very inefficient system that in many ways encourages people to overspend and to not shop around. In other countries that have public health care systems, there you basically have a government that to some extent rations health care. Now, obviously, there's problems with that as well. But one of the things that is, is very troublesome about the U.S. is that here we have this system in which we spend the most money, quite significantly more than every other country, and yet we are consistently getting worse public health outcomes right? We get public health outcomes that look more like we are a middle income or developing country and not a rich country, despite the fact that we spend much, much more, right? So, you know, the U.S. spends per person almost twice as much on health care as Britain does, right? And um, I don't know if any of you have, have know anybody from Britain or have lived there for a period of time. Um, you know, Healthcare in Britain is very, very good. In fact, I would argue it's probably better than it is in the United States. And so, you know, the fact that we're spending twice as much as Britain and not getting something nearly as good suggests that there's a big problem. And so, you know, many, many economists have, and, and this is really now getting a bit beyond the, the scope of this class, but you know some of the things that economists have talked about to try to solve some of these market failures in healthcare are things like making rationing healthcare by things other than price, right? Um, in England, it's often waiting, right? If you want to have an elective surgery, you're just going to have to wait. Um, and so you know that's there's a cost to that as well. Um, but it is one way to keep prices down. Another is to make people take into account the cost of their medical decisions, right? So in other words, make people pay a larger share of their medical, ex um, medical choices out of pocket. So things such as having bigger out-of-pocket expenses, um, having bigger deductibles. And some of this has been, um, is part of the Obamacare or the, the Obamacare um, Health Care Act which in, in, if you're part of, of, of Obamacare actually does make people pay for more of the marginal cost of their health insurance, specifically for this reason, right? To make people think about the cost of their decisions. And then there's single payer. And, you know, single payer, once again, with this getting beyond the scope of this class to talk about all the costs and advantages of having a single payer. And by single payer, I mean the government essentially pays for all health care and then determines who gets what. This is essentially the UK system, which is largely a single payer system. One of the big advantages of the single pay system is that a single payer can essentially set prices and has essentially can act like a monopolist to try to push prices down. And so, you know, um, of course, there's, there's cost to a single payer too. Some of these costs are you might have to wait to get health care. Right, you may not be able to get it immediately. Um, so, anyway, without getting too much into this, there are a lot of complicated costs and benefits associated with healthcare. In fact, healthcare economics is really a full class in and of itself. Um, maybe the main thing I just want you to, to take away from this is that we spend a lot of money on healthcare in the U.S. and we get worse outcomes. So, you know, anybody that tells you that the U.S. has the best healthcare system in the world. Um, I don't think so. <laughs> I don't think so. That's not to say that there aren't some really good things about our healthcare system. Um, but there's also some big weaknesses. And so, you know, this would be one of the areas where you would love to see some project, some, some progress in terms of public policy, in terms of, you know, radically rethinking here, um, our healthcare, because we spend a lot and we don't get our money's worth. It doesn't appear. Okay, well, that was, like I said, maybe, maybe a little bit of a, um, a sermon. I apologize. <laughs>
but <laughs> um, okay, so that, that really gets us through chapter 18. So I'm gonna let you go. Um, I'm gonna go and grade your homeworks diligently and try to um, focus on that. So um, remember, we're gonna meet back here at one o'clock, okay? So give me a little bit extra time to grade your homeworks. Meet back here at one o'clock. We will go home for homework number um, four. We'll talk about the second exam, okay? Okay, have a good lunch.